so in this illustration, we'll be talking about uh, the division, anatomical division of the prostate gland, and also the structures traversing through the gland. We would be able, like we can see on this illustration, the relationships are very much obvious. And I will be talking about the pattern of the distribution of glands within the, the prostate. Okay, so prostate is a fibromuscular gland. Okay, the anterior part of the gland is mainly like it's making the stroma and it's a lot of muscular fibers that are blending together. Okay, then uh, like anatomically, the gland has been divided into uh, five lobes. So there are lateral, right and left lateral lobes, right and left posterior lobes. And remember, this is the that vertical line of fusion that is palpable through rectal examination. So we have right and left lateral lobes, right and left posterior lobes, and then there is a median lobe that's present in the midline, okay? And that's in close relation with the uh, symphysis pubis anteriorly, okay? Now, um, the prostate gland is composed of 30 to 50 compound tubulo alveolar glands. And we can see that these are the ducts of the glands and, you know. So, and all, the ducts of all these glands would be opening up on either side of the prostatic part of urethra, and they will be dumping up the secretions within the prostatic part of urethra. So now uh, the, the glands, the, the small compound tubulo alveolar glands are, are arranged in the, in the substance of prostate in such a way that they have created three zones and we can re easily figure it out. So the innermost zone, which is encircling the urethra, prostatic part of urethra, is the transitional zone or the periurethral zone. Okay, why it's known as transitional? Because obviously uh, the, the epithelium of the urethra is transitional epithelium. So with that reference, we call it the transitional zone. And uh, that is surrounding the opening of the urethra. Then there is a central zone that's pink. And then the largest zone is the peripheral zone. And this zone contains the largest size of glands and they are highest in number. Okay? Here we are looking at the two ejaculatory ducts, how they are traversing through the substance of prostate and they are opening up into the prostatic part of urethra on either side of the urethral crest or these, uh, you know, seminal colliculus and, uh, you know, forming a, like dumping the uh, ejaculate or semen into the prosthetic part of urethra. So before okay. moving on to the other illustrations and specimens, I would like to add a, a, a few clinical considerations. Um, there is a condition most common in um, middle-aged to old men that is BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. That is the hyperplasia of the glandular tissue, which is present usually in the periurethral zone, right, or the transitional zone, and that can involve the median lobe as well as the lateral lobes, okay? So in an advanced stage of the BPH, this two, not even advanced, uh, once there is too much hyperplasia, that is going to compress over the uh, urethra prostatic urethra. So the patient definitely would be coming up with the complaints of which are related to the compression of urethra. Uh, that is generally the frequency in urination, nocturia, that is a ur uh, urge to urinate during the entire night, and dysuria, a painful uh, urination. Okay, these would be the complaints the patient would be coming up with in the clinic. So that is an indication of BPH, but it could be a prostatic cancer also. But the, the main thing is uh, on per digital rectal examination, this furrow or this, uh, you know, longitudinal uh, groove of the prostate would still be palpable because uh, the, the hyperplasia started 
from the, the transitional or innermost, innermost zone. And it has started moving on towards the lateral and the median lobe, but not to the posterior, okay? So uh, it's a benign condition, but uh, like in contrast to the BPH, when a person is suffering from a prostatic cancer, okay, uh, it's mainly the peripheral, peripheral zones that will get involved. That is mainly the posterior lobes will be affected and the, the lobes will get enlarged and then they will be palpable on per digital or uh, per, per rectal digital examination. And since the cancer starts from the peripheral zone, by the time the, there is compression over the urethra, right? And there, is, there are signs of urethral blockade. The patient definitely will be symptom-free, symptom okay? So once the patient will start complaining about the, uh, you know, dysuria, urgency, frequency, all these complaints which are also common in benign prostatic hyperplasia, by the time in, in a patient of prostate cancer, when he will start complaining, he will, uh, he will be symptomatic. The, the disease is already in, an, in a very advanced stage because it started from the peripheral zone and it kept on increasing inward towards the middle and the, oh, sorry, the central and the transitional zone. By the time it reaches the transitional zone, the cancer is already in a very advanced stage. And when they, there would be per rectal examination of the prostate, the prostate will, the substance of the prostate will, will appear or will, will you know, uh, be of very hard nodular state and there would be obliteration or disappearance of this longitudinal furrow or you know, groove that would be missing. All right, so uh, the, the, the peritoneum, the abdominal peritoneum, which enters the pelvis, now it's pelvic peritoneum. It, in the embryonic life, it, it just keeps on coming down and reaches the pelvic floor and then goes back. So creating a deep pouch during the intrauterine life. This is the appearance of the pouch, which is known as rectovesical or the zycorectal pouch, the pouch between the bladder and the uh, rectum, okay? But what happens in males that this pouch, it, it starts the lower half of the pouch, which is between the ampulla and the prostate, it just starts getting uh, fused. The two layers start getting fused, okay? Like, just like this. <clears throat> And then what happens is we can say that this rectovesical pouch in males and also in like, yeah, in males, it is not that deep. It's like shallow, like up till here. But this thing is, it, it holds a very great significance. This is known as the rectoprostatic fascia or fascia of Denon Williams. It holds a great clinical significance because this is a tough membrane, a double-layered membrane that is a fused component of the, uh, the pelvic peritoneum. So it, first of all, the ampulla of the rectum glides over it freely and also the prostate. But the good thing is this fascia, it just uh, inhibits the spread of cancer especially the adenocarcinoma of prostate gland, which involves the posterior lobes, which we just have discussed. That the spread, the posterior spread of that carcinoma has been limited by this fascia of denomilliers, okay? Or the rectoprostatic fascia. And that's why the, 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 the cancer of uh, prostate usually doesn't involve the rectum. Uh, as compared to the other organs, the metastasis of prostate gland, uh, it's, it just involves all the other organs uh, and the, the components of the pelvic cavity, except for uh, the ampulla or the rectum for a very long time. It's just because of this blessing 
the fascia of denim layers or the rectal prostatic fascia. 